day of speakers um, today. So um, without further ado, I would like to get each of them to introduce themselves because I'm very bad at reading everybody's bios. So um, I will start with, let's go with Abby. I was hoping you wouldn't start with me. Hi, everyone. Alphabetical order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. First, first name and surname is always the first. Um, very nice to meet you all. My name is Abby Dari, and I'm an author. I'm author of A Girl with a Louding Voice. And I'm very, very excited to be here tonight. Um, and next up, we have Arzu. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Arzu Tarsin. I'm editor at large at Bonnier. I've worked in publishing for almost 30 years. I'm also a consultant editor with the Good Literary Agency. Um, there you are. Awesome. And then we have Natalie. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Natalie Jerome. I'm a literary agent at uh, Curtis Brown. I'd probably um, say that I've not had a job outside of books since I was 20. Um, so uh, I went to a bookshop my last term at university, um, then got a job at um, Barnes & House as an editorial assistant, worked my way up to publisher, was uh, probably best known for my run on boy bands and bands um, generally. Um, when I worked there, um, Little Mix and uh, JLS and One Direction and various others. Um, I mostly specialise in commercial fiction as an agent, I look after Selene Henry, David Harewood, and many others. Um, and do we have Amy or has she? Yep, I'm here, hello. Hi, Amy, would you love, would love for you to introduce yourself? <laughs> Sorry, my internet was being, <laughs> being nothing, but they does sometimes. Um, hi, my name is Amy Mae Baxter. I'm a senior editor at Dialogue Books um, and I commission mainly commercial fiction, rom-coms and women's fiction in particular, though I do dabble in literary from time to time. I'm also the founder and editor-in-chief of Bad Form, a books magazine by and about writers of colour. Awesome. Um, I forgot to introduce myself, weirdly, but... Um... Hello everyone, my name is Raifa. Um, I am a lawyer, podcaster, but most importantly, I'm also a trustee of the Women's Prize Trust. Um, and this event uh, will be asking these amazing panelists all sorts, all sorts of questions relating to the publishing world, relating to representation, um, writing and how to get your book published. So if you do have any questions, please make sure to um, just put them in the little chat box and in the end once we've um, kind of finalized our discussion we'll be able to go through them and all of this is to actually just encourage you all to um, participate and submit into the discoveries program um, and for those of you who don't know discoveries is a really unique writing development program um, which is open to all women in the UK um, and Ireland who are over 18 plus. Um, and for this, you don't need to have a whole book written. So count your lucky stars there. You only need to upload or submit 10,000 words and it doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to show some promise. This year's judges are the amazing Kate Moss, Kieran Millwood, Chibundu Onuzu. Um, we've got Lucy Morris and Anna Davis. And there are some very amazing prizes to be won, of course. Um, you get an amazing creative writing course with personalized mentorship packages. You also get representation with a literary agent. Um, and we, of course, have a literary agent here today with us who will be able to tell you more about how that relationship looks like. And my um, favorite part is the 5K prize. So, um, make sure you get to submitting. Um, the submissions are open and um, I believe the deadline is in January, the, the 20, 15th of January, 2023. And the long list will be announced in May. Um, so yeah, if you do have any questions with regards to discoveries, please also um, ask any questions on that. And there'll be links throughout the chat that will be dropped in so that um, you get any information that you that you want. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, and thank you all so much for um, attending this evening.
Now, I'm going to try and kind of um, separate our discussion into three parts because we've got um, various types of panelists here. So we've got, you know, Abby, who's the writer. Um, we've got, you know, literary agents and we've got um, editors at large. And so I think it might be really good just to have some sort of structure. We can talk about it in that sense. But before we um, do that, I'd really love to get an understanding of, I guess, the day-to-day -day roles in which um, all of you here do. So, you know, as a writer, as an agent, as, a, as editors, what does your role look like? Um, and I'm not going to pick on you, Abby. <laughs> I won't pick on you. Instead, I will start with Amy. I was not expecting that. Okay, so I am an editor. Um, so my job essentially is to find books that I think should be published and publish them. Um, an editor at my, my level, I'm a senior editor. Um, so I work on other people's books as well as my own. Um, so I see books from acquisition. That's when we acquire them usually through an agent um, or sometimes through prizes. Um, we pick up books, we work on them structurally. So for fiction, that will be working on characters plot pacing tone all those fun things and we will do all the copy editing proofreading the cover design and as an editor sort of like a project manager um in the in the way I like to think of it in that we bring you from manuscript all the way to publication and beyond um so my day-to-day -day is a lot of reading shocking um a lot of meetings <laughs> with some people like agents but also our sales teams rights teams marketing and publicity um, so, and also doing fun things like this, doing outreach. I work for Dialogue Books. Um, Dialogue is a division of Hachette UK, which is the second biggest publishing house in the UK. And we are dedicated to publishing um, authors of colour, LGBTQ plus writers, working class writers, and those who are marginalised traditionally in the publishing world in the UK. Um, so that's my day-to-day -day mission and yeah, a bit of what I do in my actual work. It's so interesting that, you know, in my head as an editor, I just kind of picture you um, sat down at your desk or maybe on the treadmill um, with a book <laughs> and you're just reading manuscripts. So I never really, you know, it's it news to me that you're so involved in every other sort of part of the sort of book life rather than just sitting down and reading all day. Absolutely, yes. I mean, I wish I got to read manuscripts in my day-to-day -day life. Um, I think the others here on this panel will also appreciate that we don't really get that much chance to read in our day-to-day -day life. That's usually on my way to work or on my weekends. Um, yeah, much of your day is spent liaising with other departments and making sure um, making sure the book is best positioned as it can be. I mean, we are a capitalist industry. What we're doing is we're here to sell your book as much as we are to make it the best product possible. Um, so yes, it's definitely different to how yeah I envisioned being an editor being when I was younger, shall we say. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, so let's pivot to Natalie. Um, as an agent, what does your day-to-day -day look like? It's usually uh, fighting my inbox and several inboxes, actually. So um, people writing, budding writers, aspiring writers from all over the world um, in various different um, capacities as well. So fiction, nonfiction, though I mentioned earlier that um, my background is specialised in um, commercial nonfiction. Uh, that was very much just working in-house at a, a major publishing company. And the way that um, uh, publishers are structured is that it's very much, you know, work in fiction or non-fiction or children's, adult or, um, uh, you know, children's publishing. And so, um, you know, invariably you end up specialising in one particular area. The mm. joy I'm finding of being a literary agent is that actually you don't have to specialise in a particular area. You can you know, follow your tastes and interests and that's brilliant. So that's across the board now. So, so my day to day, um, you know, kind of uh, everyday uh, working life is, is supporting writers as much as possible, um, championing them, talking to publishers, obviously a lot. Um, about uh, prospective books that are coming through, um, crafting and shaping um, someone's story. And I would say that when I was working in-house as a commissioning editor, that actually kind of looking at the market and figuring out, you know, who should be writing was a big 
part of my job. Um, so not necessarily waiting for agents to send me projects, but to actually outreach myself. And so one of the, the lovely things now as a literary agent is the kind of doing that all the time, as opposed to doing that a bit of the time and then focusing on actually making books and getting them off to um, print. And so, so yeah, so essentially that, that's it. And supporting writers, as I say, and championing them and effectively, you know, kind of being, uh, you know, their, their go-to person um, with regards to, you know, shaping the story and then getting that to the right publisher is almost like a matchmaking role, mm. finding the right um, author story for the right publisher. Yeah. Um, and you know worked very closely on that I like that analogy of a of a matchmaker because you you need to have those close relationships with the editors in the different publishing houses to know what they want um yeah and also yes. where that book and that author will fit best yes and also I think it's really important to kind of follow your own gut instincts about you know, stories and the stories that you feel should be out there in the world. And, you know, a big part of Amy's touched on it, but a big part of the work that I think we're all trying to do is um, support writers from underrepresented backgrounds. So if you were to look at kind of my taste and interest over the years, whether, you know, celebrities or, or not, the kind of through line is people from either working class backgrounds people who have really interesting and I think important stories that might not necessarily hit or reach the market and you would be surprised and I've had a lot of people say this to me over the years oh well you know it, it's obvious that a boy band like JLS would be published but actually I could tell you a whole story about how JLS got published because of the way that the publishing system in terms of taste and interest mm. is currently it's, it's changing that yeah. has been structured so so yeah. yeah awesome thank you so much Natalie um and I'm very excited to, to hear this because I'm a writer um but my, I guess my today day-to-day -day life as a writer is very different to yours Abby um and I would really love to know like you know as successful as you are with such an incredible book you know what is the day-to-day -day life as as a writer in, in now but when you were writing the girl with the louding voice how how did it look like day to day getting that manuscript over the line thank you for asking that because that was why I kept my intro quite short because I knew I was going to talk a bit about my, my life before the girl with the louding voice so I spent sort of 15 to 18 years working in corporate project management working for many FTSE 100 companies in London and so writing for me was something I did during lunchtime and during weekends, it was um, just determining to tell whatever story I was writing at that time. So I've been writing for about about as long as I've been in the UK. So I came to the UK in 20, 2001, so about 22 years now. And I started writing straight from when I came in um, into a blog and then into fiction. Um, but since writing The Girl with Louding Voice, I now, now I write full time. I've got two children. Uh, I've got a husband who feels like a third child or a first child. And so I my days very much um, get the kids ready for school. Whoever's dropping them off that morning, I try to do a walkout to a Pilates class or something. And I'm re literally writing from the moment I sit down. I tend to write in cafes um, or in a, a gym. So the, the gym I currently attend have like a cafe downstairs. And I like the noise, which is... Um, not you know it's not shared across many writers but I like to write to a lot of noise and I love to edit to a lot of silence so you find me editing in my home office here or in a library and so I sit down at the gym or at the cafe and I'm writing I try to have a target word count daily so I try to write up to 2,000 words um, even if it might not make sense half through halfway through I'm thinking this is absolute crap but I tend not to stop and that's because I feel that I heard it a while back that writing is, is a muscle and you have to keep keep sort of exercising it. And I found it works quite well for me. And so I, I do I do my ward count for the day and then do everything else around being a mummy, get the kids to bed at night. And then late at night, I tend to go over whatever it is I've written for that day. And then I make a decision whether I need to carry on writing this sin or this chapter, whatever it is I'm working on, or it needs to be discarded and started again the next day. 
And that's what I do day in, day out, including weekends and sometimes even Christmas Day if I, if I can. Yeah. Um, follow up question. What happens on those days that you just don't feel like writing? What do you do? When I don't feel like writing, I tend to read. Um, but because I, I'm a very interesting reader, I read when I read books. So if I read a book in, in very strong sort of third person or first person, when I'm writing, I find that I'm influenced by that writer. It's very weird. I find that I, it takes me a long time to really think about the story I'm writing, to write in the same voice, um, because I've been heavily influenced by what I'm reading. So I, I try to read thematically. So if I'm writing in first person, I gather books that are written in first person present, and I try to keep my motivation goal going that way. So I do that. But I also for forgot another part of my life, so which is attending a lot of events, responding to emails, um, and doing all of that. So I do that as well. But sometimes I just when I can't do anything, like it's absolutely not going through, I just leave it. Um, and I often feel like I haven't had, haven't done well. I am quite hard on myself, I'll be honest. Um, but I just tend to leave it and just take a breather and start again the next day. It's amazing, amazing advice. Um, my gym also has somewhere to sit down. So that <laughs> I'll be taking my laptop there tomorrow morning. Um, yes. so thank you for that. Um, <laughs> and um Arzu, tell us about your day-to-day -day life um, and how does that look like? Well, my day is very similar to Amy's, I have to say. I mean, no, absolutely no reading in the office. You know, that's the, the great myth of being an editor. Um, um, I mean, it's interesting for writers, you know, because you form a relationship with them from the very beginning. It's pretty intimate because you're editing their work. They've mostly sat in a room by themselves for years and then they've shared it with you and they're waiting to hear what you think. It is, it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a lovely relationship and it is very special. Um, and so you want to cultivate that and you don't want to cultivate it just through the editorial process, which is, you know, you might do a couple of rounds of editing. You actually become their friend all the way to publishing. So you're, you're constantly goading various departments in-house to retain the vision they had for this book on acquisition. And that's that's pretty tricky because we're buying books all the time as publishers. Um, and, you know, sometimes you find yourself thinking, wow, I didn't buy this book with my own money. You know, we bought it as a company. So let's all carry on. You know, so that's that's a really big part of an editor's job. Um, but, you know, it. it, it it's a great part of it as well. You don't lose touch with your with your author or the book all the way to publication. And then, you know, when it's successful or whatever it does, it feels like your success as well. Um, yeah. And that is a great part of, of being an editor. Amazing. Um, so when we talk about, I guess, the life of a book um, and and we're starting with, with writing, um, you know, we do want you guys to really submit into the um, into discoveries. And when we think about maybe those 10,000 words, um, I also know that when you're submitting to agents, for instance, they also want to see, you know, either three chapters or maybe the equivalent of 10,000 words. Um, so I'm going to pose this question to Abby and, and, and Natalie. Um, first of all, Abby, when you started the your your journey and when you wanted to get those first three chapters into um, an agent's hand, what were you thinking and, and what do you think helped um, in having in those in those three, you know, three chapters that allowed you to, you know, get the representation that you got? Um, that is such a great question. So. I think for me, I was terrified. I'm sure, you know, all new writers are. I was terrified of, of rejection. And as a creative, you you there's a there's a place in you that you nurse. You, you nurse that place of your fragile creativity and you really don't want it to get broken. But rejection is part of the, the writing life. And I had to sort of psych myself um, into getting the first sort of, and I think I did that for one or, one or two of my books before I stopped. And so, um, I try to polish it to death, um, overwrite in many places, lots of flowery, flowery descriptions and pulling it together and reading. And of course, you know, before you send to an agent, you have to check that each 
agents, you're, you're meeting their submission guidelines because because some might be quite different. So it's important to do that, ensure you're addressing the right agent, you know, sending it off to somebody else and doing all of that and putting it through together and, and, and keep and submit and not being able to think of anything else while you know you wait and many times I think first, the first few times I had absolutely zero response um and then I had I think I had one response um this was before louding voice um one of these agents who was US based responded to say that she she liked what I'd written could I send more and I did and I never heard anything back and I I think I murdered her in my mind over and over again for not coming back but now that I now that I'm a writer I now understand that it's not personal and that you know agents get inundated and all of that. So that was that was hard. Um, but but I think that one of the, one or two of the rejections that I got were were nice and tailored, and I think those helped me to decide to park that manuscript at that time or those manuscripts at that time and just take my mind off it. Now I then decided with the girl with the louding voice. I think I decided not to actively pursue. The traditional route of getting an agent and this is why i'm advocating for 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 prizes like discovery's prize because there's something about knowing that you're not alone that there are hundreds of thousands of writers like you who are targeting sending a submission to writers um who will be judging your prize and who understand that you're coming into this potentially for the first time and um and I think that really gave me the confidence I needed to submit for to the prize that I want because I, I I got my agent through through a, a creative writing prize, um, very similar to the Discoveries Prize, um, and so with that, with the Louding Voice, the rejections were were not as were not as fast and frequent. I think I only got one or two um, before I gave up and just thought I'll just get get down the competition route. Mm. Um, and Natalie, just on the on the other side, when you do receive submissions um or when you do receive that cover letter or cover email from um a writer who wants to be potentially published and and want representation from you what are you looking for not just in terms of the the, the writing but also the the entire submission okay we can't hear her <laughs> She is on mute. Okay, she's on mute. Oh, yes. there yes. we go. Sorry, the host cut to unmute me. Um, yeah, so one of the things um, I think is really super important is to um, bear in mind, obviously, you know, a lot of agents are being approached all the time <laughs> um, with. Um, of book ideas and uh, I think it's really important and one of the things that I'm asked possibly most frequently and I do want to kind of put this to bed is the idea that you have to have a big social media presence that you have to have you know however many number of followers on uh, TikTok or Twitter or whatever in order to get a book deal really genuinely it is about your story whether you're writing for children, whether it's fiction, whatever, non-fiction, it's about the clarity of your voice, the clarity of um, your story, the urgency of it. And one of the things I, I just over the years, have always been um, drawn to stories that tell me something about the human condition, <laughs> you know, whether that's, um, you know, a comedian, um, uh, Alan Carr, um, you know, writing about um, growing up, you know, up north in Northampton with his um, football uh, manager dad um, and not fitting in um, to, you know, now David Harewood writing about race and mental health. And so there's just something about the, the clarity of the voice, the clarity of the story and the urgency of it. Um, and I think that's what all agents are hopefully um, wants and are looking for. So, you know, I'm asked a lot about, do you need to write a full book? Um, I have to say that has been possibly uh, with the transition from being a publisher editor to an agent and then working in fiction um, and across fiction, the biggest surprise to me. And I um, do want to talk about this a little bit more as in uh, publishers expecting writers, authors to deliver a whole manuscript 
in order to get commissioned. And in nonfiction, it doesn't work. We can talk about this with, you know, the group. It doesn't work that way in nonfiction. But in fiction, there is that expectation. And when we talk about barriers and certainly, you know, underrepresented voices, I do think this is a bit of an issue because it's expensive to write. It's expensive mm. to expect anyone to write 80, 90,000 words on the hope that they might get a book deal. I just recently sold something, um, a, a trilogy um, for a comic book writer on five chapters. And I was very pleased about that. And I was asked quite a lot through the process and through the submission process um, if he could write more and write the whole book. And I felt very strongly about that because he's black, Birmingham young, um, that that's a, a big ask, but we can talk about that. So, so I think it's really important as I say, to have that clarity of voice. This particular author I felt did, and I was you know, super confident in taking him to market and obviously he got a three book deal, but, but you know, it is an issue. And I, I wouldn't want anyone, particularly in this group, to be put off by that that, you know, there are agents who will champion and they should champion, you know, your work um, as much as possible. And as I say, match make. Too. Yeah. Yeah. And when it when it does come to, I guess, putting that writer's work to market, as you say, and, um, and once you've obviously worked with them on finishing a manuscript and you're now ready to, you know, move the baton on to Arzu and, and Amy in regards to, getting it taken up by a publishing house. Um, what, what is the work that goes on between, you know, you um, as the agent and, and the writer um, to be able to get that manuscript ready? Um, and how is, I guess, your work in getting that book to kind of be at an okay place so that the likes of Arzu and Amy will be able to take it on? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of editorial work, so crafting and shaping um, the story, but also working on the pitch. We talk a lot about at the elevator pitch. And for me, this is a bit of a hangover of, of being in the role of Amy and um, Arzu and going into the, the uh, you know, uh, boardroom meeting room and pitching to a group and mm. you know, commissioning books by effectively by committee. So, you know, essentially it's important that everyone in that room has bought into your project as an editor. And then, you know, if you add the additional layer of, you know, you want your books to be commercially successful so that you can keep your job, then you really want everyone to be invested. And so the elevator pitch, when we talk about that, that's your top line, um, you know, Netflix, uh, this is like, or it is similar to. There's a lot of criticism um, at times within the publishing industry about what we call comps, competition. Um, but the publishing process kind of six and one half a dozen of the other, slightly dependent on it. So the sales team within a publishing house will compare um, a prospective book to the sales performance of a book that has already been published. And so, and it happens in not just in publishing, but you know, film and other creative industries, but particularly in publishing, that's kind of how it works. So the, the elevator pitch, so being able to say very confidently and clearly, succinctly, my book is this, this is the, the top line story, um, and it is similar to, so, for example, when I started having conversations with the actor David Harewood um, about writing a memoir, the comp was this behind me. So when I first set up as an agent, I bought this. <laughs> um, I sorted out this room, turned it into an office and um, bought this uh, print. And actually nothing to do with David Harewood. It was actually to do with me. Um, but I really connected with the story. I'd read the book years ago at university. And one of the things that um, kind of struck me in all the conversations about uh, mental health, race and mental health, that no one from a British perspective had written about race and mental health with the kind of profile that somebody like a David Harewood could bring to the, com the conversation. And so when it came to the pitch, the elevator pitch, it was, 
well, no one has really talked about race and mental health for possibly 50, 60 years at this level. And the last book I can think of is this. Is Invisible Man of Ellison. So that's the, the very top line elevator pitch that then as a baton, and we talk about this a lot in the publishing industry of passing information on. And so from the agents, well, from the writer, their creative vision to the agents, to the commissioning editor, the commissioning editor then to the publicist and sales and marketing and everyone, then out of that boardroom meeting room to the retailers and so on. So it's really important that that pattern of information from the writer's creative vision all the way through then eventually to the reader yeah. is watertight. So, so yeah. Thank you so much for that, Natalie. Um, and I guess when that pattern goes from Natalie and to you, Arzu, in the publishing house, what, you know, I'd love to hear of any advice that you have for writers or you know when you're speaking to agents about prospective um novels or other aspects of writing whether short stories or, or you know poetry or whatever it is what what are you looking for as an editor and or what do you know you know track record if you if you see this one thing or all these various different things you know that you'd want to acquire this this piece of work um so I work for the Good Literary Agency, which is an agency that promotes the, the, the writers of BAME, LGBTQ, working class, Northern writers. Um, and I work as a, a developmental editor. So often, you know, there are certain communities that don't have access to the creative writing scene or, or, or nowhere near London. So sometimes, you, you know, the works are quite raw that's, that's coming in. But, you know, within that um, field of work, there are gems, there is gold, you know, and I can, I can see it. Um, and for me, it's about voice. So if we have a powerful voice and strong characterization, you know, I'm sold at that level. You know, I mean, I mean in terms of plot, obviously, you know, we want a great plot. But that's all stuff you can do with the with the author down down the line. But it voice is very important. Um, but what's different to my role, you know, when I'm commissioning is that um, the work has already been, you know, through, through the gatekeeper of an agent. They've already done a hell of a lot of work on it. Um, and, I, and I get a much more finessed piece of work. Um, and but the same is true. It is about voice for me that that's everything, whether it's third, first, even second. As long as I can connect, then they don't have to be a good person necessarily. But if I can connect with our protagonist or antagonist, then you're halfway sold to me. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm prepared to do more work. So that's that's the thing. I mean, I, I worry sometimes about um, author fatigue once they've been through the process of being edited by their agent. Maybe they did belong to some creative writing group. They've been edited there. You know what? So I'm slightly wary by the time they come to me, you know, I've had enough already, but um, I try and handle that very carefully. Um, I understand that you guys have, I mean, I was edited once and I feel so sorry for that editor because there are so many things that I wanted to keep and they wanted to um, change. But I wanted to ask um, Amy whether you, you know, you've ever been in that position of when you're working with writers, um, and how does that relate, how do you cultivate that relationship so that it's a smooth sailing? Um, and how do you handle sort of differences in ideas uh, whilst, you know, still trying to, to work on, and keep the essence of, of the novel or, or of the piece of writing? Um, I'd say a lot of this has to do, I guess, as everyone else has been saying, with the relationship that you have. I mean, first up, your relationship with your agent is a much, well, hopefully not a much longer term relationship than you have with your editor, but that's sort of a lifelong commitment. And if you don't feel like your agent's in your corner, having those difficult discussions with your editor for you, you know, you're already at a disadvantage. You really need to be able to trust your agent. Um, so I'd really underline when you're, <laughs> if you're getting to that point to really make that decision carefully and and not just rush it um you know my job as an editor and maybe also will, will agree with me is is not to upset people it's to help you craft the novel in the way that it we feel is the strongest most commercial 
most beautiful novel we can um, together. It's working together. It's us versus the problem. To put it in that sort of like weird Brene Brown relationship term, it's it's not sort of us as an editor versus you, the writer, trying to cut bits out and, and take things that you don't like away. It's very much a, a joint process. I mean, of course, it's ultimately a creative output. It's never going to be, I imagine, super fun. I've never been on the other end of it, but I can't imagine it's super fun to have someone be like, no, cut that paragraph. I don't like this character. Uh, pull this plot point up. Um, but it's always with your best interests at heart. And look, everyone works differently. I have authors who like sort of to sit with you for three hours on the phone and talk through every talk through every single line edit I've got authors who like an email and then not to speak to me for a month while they work through their edits and then return a manuscript four weeks later um and I think every a good editor I'd like to think would be very flexible with you and work with you the best way that you will um that you would prefer to um but also you should have in most cases an agent who will will step in and be there throughout that process um so you don't always feel like you have to go to the editor and be like I absolutely disagree there's someone who can sort of step in for you sometimes so that shouldn't be happening often because everyone should be on the same page most of the time and an editor when they try and buy your book will set out a vision um, as we've discussed and Natalie mentioned earlier of where they think this book is going how they want to sell it um, so there shouldn't really be any nasty surprises when it gets to the editing stage I don't think or well, you'd hope not yeah and when is um to the both editors when is when is the book finished because I find that you can constantly edit and edit and change and amend and make better and better um but how do you know when to step away from something and say you know what this is this is it this is now done um Arzi, how about you um well a very interesting part of the process is when you're trying to buy the book you you share it with your editorial team which is the people in your imprint and then it goes to the wider team which is sales marketing and publicity and rights and every step of this way one of those people and it might even be 20 people will come to you with their editorial thoughts you know suddenly everyone's an editor and you just have to kind of screen them out and when you're editing you know you'll do a couple of drafts definitely with your author and hopefully you're on the same page um, it depends how you handle it. if you handle it with sensitivity your relationship should be fine um the the truth is you bought this book because you loved it. You know, you're, it, you're on the same page already. There should be no nasty surprises. Um, and you decide when it's finished. You know, it's, it's not for anyone else. You just know we're done. It's great. You know, there might be a few things you had to let go, but they're not to the detriment of the book. You know, they might be small things, a difference of opinion. My God, it's their book. You know, they can, <laughs> they can direct it in whichever way they want. And you did buy it. So... So um, as an editor, you you just kind of know when it's done. Yeah. Would you agree, Amy? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, look, I'm not as, as by far not as an experienced editor as you. Um, so it's just interesting you hear so hearing you say that. But yes, I think there is always an extent, you know, when you buy a book, it is because you love it and you have a specific vision for it. And sometimes it exceeds those expectations. Um, but as you said, you know, your editor should never make you publish a book before you feel it's ready. And I'd like to think that doesn't happen, though. Natalie may may disagree that maybe it doesn't so need to myself. <laughs> um yeah no, no I think you know dialogue we have a very strict policy like we'd rather delay the book a year rather you know make sure that book is is happy as it is rather than try and rush out a book that no one's happy with and you know I think most editors would agree so there will always be more time you know I'd like to think yeah awesome um and Abby as the you know, most of us writers here can recognize that you are the goals here right um but during the whole process of of writing what was for you the difficult parts and you know what were the challenges and the hurdles that you had to jump that stick out to you um you know how did you navigate them and and what advice would you give you know all the budding authors here you're on mute <laughs> yeah, absolutely um I think for for the girl with the louding voice because of the the kind of process I had I mean, having won the competition and then getting an agent, I, I had I had a number of agents offer, um, which is a dream place to be. So I think that was the first hurdle I had. It was who is the best for me? Who will be there for me when I may not have a book like The Girl with Louding Voice, when I have written a book that I feel not great about and have been in, in that position before um, recently. So who will be there to say, Abby, do you want to give it another go? 
do you want to try something else or do you want to keep working with this I was looking for friendship kind of like a marriage and so what I did in that position was to sort of meet every single agent so this was before COVID so it was nice to to get free lunch as well but of course to, to meet with them just to get a sense of who they are behind the professional sort of veil do we relate on the same level um can we be friends can we laugh about certain things so that was that was a bit of a challenge for me trying to figure out what agent to work with uh, and then I selected the best agent for me and um and then in the trying to, to work again I got into a position where I had more than one publisher interested in my book so that was and that was actually a major headache for me because I had to really think hard about the best publisher that would get the vision of the girl with the louding voice out to market knowing that this is a book reaching a very very specific voice um this is a book that may be marmite so might be loved might not be that loved and so just trying to to work with a publisher that again will be there for me once the book is out in the market and whatever comes out of that of that process and again it was meeting every single publisher and what I was looking for in in and everyone was lovely but I was really looking for that spark that fire in the eyes if they got the vision for not just the book but also for my career as a writer the kind of stories I want to tell knowing that I'm Nigerian and I love to tell Nigerian stories I don't want to be forced to write anything that I'm not comfortable writing are you that kind of publisher and so trying to have those conversations and selecting the right one and then moving over that to when we got to the point where I was being edited and because I was edited at the same time by two publishers across the Atlantic, I got a lot of notes. And I, I remember getting the notes and thinking, there's no way I'm going to do this. There's no way I'm going to make these edits um, work properly because um, it just felt like a lot. But I think sitting down, taking a step back. So I, I mentioned that I write every day, but when I finish writing a particular piece of work, I tend to step back from that piece of work and work on something else. So with this one, um, I, I took a, a breather and, and just took it all in and then went back to reworking. And it, it meant cutting out about 20,000 words of the book. And, and, and I'm now at that point where if I have to take half of the book apart and rewrite it, I'm at the point where I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. So I'm, I've, I've come to that point in my writing career that I'm willing to give it what it takes because I've come to realize that all the only thing you can control is what goes onto the manuscript before it goes out to print. So give it your absolute best shot. I, I think it was Azu or, or was it Amy that was saying that if it, if it has to wait a year, never be in a hurry to get something out just because you think everybody else, somebody's going to steal your, your idea or somebody's going to write that big book that, you, you know, the great American novel, the great British novel, take your time. If it's your story, if it matters to you, somebody out there, when it gets out at the right time, will feel that passion. So if I don't feel enthusiastic about the story, if I'm not thinking about my characters, um, I really don't want that book out there. And so just getting to that point where I'm making the best edits as I can and feeling comfortable enough to ask for more time to get the vision out of my head onto paper. Because often there's a disconnect there as a writer, what you have in your head and what comes out on paper are completely two different things sometimes. And so it's just knowing and being comfortable enough to have that conversation with the relevant people and hoping that they will support you. And which is why it's important to have the right agent and the right publisher from yeah. the first, from the word go. Thank you so much. That was really in depth and I really enjoyed it. Um, and I also wanted to ask, we always get, you know, ask advice about what writers should do um, to, you know, get noticed um, and for visibility. Um, and I also wanted to touch on Natalie when you mentioned about the idea of, you know, you don't need to have social media, for instance, to, to you know, to be successful as, as a writer. Um, a lot of, I guess, new generation writers get really worried about this um, this thing because we do find a lot of people who are visible on, on social media. What, within both as an agent, but also as editors in a publishing house, how do you, how do you ensure that once you've created this amazing book, um, that it gets the visibility that it deserves and, and you know, it, it goes to the readers who, you know, will we'll be reading it and, you know, will be everywhere in, in, in the shelves and, and the booksellers will be, you know, giving it out to people and recommending them to read. 
Um, I think my, you know, so many people's biggest nightmare is publishing and, you know, your mum and your friends buy a copy um, <laughs> and you know, maybe nobody else. So, um, yeah, Amy and Arzu, how, how do, I guess, publishing houses, I guess, you know, cycle and make sure that these books are actually marketed in a way that, you know, gives great credit to to the hard work that the writers have done. It's a, it's a really big question, really important question. I think, you know, as we've said, I think probably several times, you know, everything in publishing is a team effort. Although the writer writes the book, you know, with the publishing house, we have to get behind you as a team. And that involves being, yeah, everyone being involved from the very beginning. And if there's buy-in when you buy that book initially, those, pe- those are the same people who, in theory, will be publishing you, um, doing your campaign two years down the line doing that paperback campaign three years down the line it will be a sustained thing and they should be thinking about your whole career when they're marketing you not just that one book but you as an author um, especially when you're a debut I think you know it's 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 tough being a debut it's tough being a debut in the British market um, and that's that's just a fact in the these days I guess it's always been true um, but when we're we're marketing it is with a message in mind and the book should always be able to stand for itself as an editor you'd hope that the writing can always be backed up uh, will always back up that hook no matter how good the package is the writing has to sell itself as well um, but none of that matters if the marketing publicity team is not behind that initial pitch that you put together right at the beginning um, so I apologize it's not a particularly exciting answer but I'd say it's sort of cyclical in that everyone has to be enthusiastic and that drive has to come from the editor which has to come from the agent which has to come from initially the writer um you know it's it's important that a writer is excited about promoting that book as much as the editor is um we've spoken quite a lot about sort of the time this takes when I buy a, a novel um I tend to be publishing it a year and a half two years down the line if you've been writing your novel for two years and then you've had an agent for a year working on it and then selling it and then I'm publishing it two years later you spent a lot of time with this book so you as a writer um in this audience here you also have to be happy to to put your put your work in do your publicity do your marketing and it gets quite repetitive and quite difficult at times though when you're speaking about something you love it's it's not that difficult I imagine I love yeah. talking to my authors and to my authors so yes Um, No, I mean, I start, of course, I mean, I've, I know that there are so many authors out there who, you know, they don't need to have that social media presence, but then there are those, you know, when we do talk about underrepresented, represented communities, um, there, there does need to be, you know, extra oomph and, and diverse strategies to ensure that these writers who are already underrepresented are, you know, have their books widely circulated and, and, and championed by everyone. Um, and in, you know, leading into that, you know, we we are completely aware of, of these different voices that, um, that, you know, aren't heard. And I wanted to ask Arzu, especially with um, the Good Agency, um, you know, what are some amazing initiatives that publishing is doing right now um, that you think could ensure that this, you know, dichotomy of of statistics, um, you know, gets to a level playing field in the future? Well, I think publishing has responded really well, actually. Um, if you have a look, there is an initiative within almost every publishing house, and that's exactly what was needed. The gatekeepers needed to change within our industry, and I and I see great progress. The new books that are coming in in the last five or six years have all done spectacularly well. You know, it's that there was, you know, the, the, the sort of I'd, well, uh, years and years ago, it, you'd be met with feedback, which is who's going to read this book? You know, it's, it's a, a, a book about a drama set in a Nigerian village, like who's going to read this? Well, you know, that that whole thing has changed and it's been proven, you know, it's been proven to work. So. I mean, that that is what is key for diversity in our industry, the fact that we see success and we do see it because our gatekeepers are changing um, and and they're reflecting the tastes of the audience, which are diverse and rich and and, and is ready for this 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 shift in in our reading. Um, But just to go back to the social media point, you know, we used to publish books before there was social media. You know, not everyone had a, you know, no one had a Twitter feed. Um, <laughs> and so, and so, you know, I, I think our sort of colleagues, and I, you will probably agree, Amy, have to be reminded of that now and then, you know, 
they haven't got a social media platform okay so let's just do it the old-fashioned way let's word of mouth this book get booksellers talking about it make sure that we publish you know in terms of presentation and the cover into the right um, genre the right market for this book we, we have got incredible tools and we can use them but we all have to be on the same page um, and that's that, that that's again an ongoing conversation and it happens with every single book that we publish yeah. um I wanted to ask Amy um just you know in terms of you know representation and and, and you know you set up um bad form I believe um to sort of tackle uh, representation, um, you know, within publishing, and you know, it aligns with the work that girl dreamers do. And I just wanted for you to, you know, get on a platform and, and tell us more about what bad form is and 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 what it aims to achieve. Um. Yeah. I mean, so in 2016, there were just under a quarter of a million books published in Britain. Um, less than 100 were by British BAME writers. Um, less than 100 out of a quarter of a million. A quarter of a million means that's about 75 books publishing each day. So about a day and a half's worth of publishing <laughs> with British BAME writers, which is, I was going to say a rude word, but it's it's mad when you think about all the genres, all the types of books, and um, not a single black British male novelist was published that year. Um, statistics are more and more hard to come by, GDPR, publishing houses not keeping them, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the sort of uh, the, the ground on which we we, we sit. Um, not to say that these bestsellers don't happen. I mean, ours has published a great number of, of fantastic um, bestselling writers of colour. Um, but you know, it's it's a real issue. And another issue that comes from that is that there is a lack of review coverage. Review coverage is shrinking across the across um, papers, magazines, all these things as the sort of journalism is having its own issues over there, which I won't dive into. Um, but, you know, a thing that sells books is, is book reviews. Um, you see on the cover, you see phenomenal, amazing, fantastic. Even if you've not heard the magazine or whatever that, that said that, you do pay attention. Um, so Bad Form was it was a small attempt at trying to address that for writers of colour who are statistically, and I will send you the stats if you don't believe me, um, being left out by The Guardian, by The Literary Review, by The TLS, White Review, all those places which we go to for book reviews, they, were, they weren't being reviewed. Um, so as an, an Asian woman myself, um, it was important to me that I could provide a small space where writers of colour could both practice their writing um, by writing these reviews and, and also get those writers of colours the reviews that they deserved. Um, it's both been very exciting and slightly discouraging to see how many of our reviews are used on covers of best-selling books these days, but there we go. Um, who'd have thought that we'd have been so useful to the publishing industry as a bunch of graduates? Um, but there we go. Um, so yes, it's that specifically for writers of colour, but obviously there are issues with working class writers being represented, LGBT LGBTQ plus writers being represented, all sorts of underrepresented writers. I chose to focus on people of colour because I mean, I'm Asian and that's what I know. And those are the statistics that were available at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but as Arzu said, there are numerous attempts across the industry to try and bring people into this world of publishing. Um, I was, you know, really chuffed to be a reader for the Discovery Prize last year, and it was really fantastic. Um, so just to reiterate that the scheme is really amazing. I found some really incredible writers through here. Um, so although this is a really depressing set of statistics I just gave you, I promise we're not all awful. People are trying to make a difference. Publishing houses want, want to sell books. Books. And as I said, you know, books are selling for underrepresented yeah. writers as they should. Um, so write a book, publish a book. You know, that's what we're here for. Let's do it. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, we have 15 minutes and I'm very much aware of the time and we've got amazing questions. So um, if anybody doesn't have any other further thoughts, I'll go into the questions. There's quite a few here now. Um, Right, this is probably for um, Abby. I've um, got a question that says, how can you manage writing well with a stressful full-time job? And also what makes a good cover letter? So I think, I guess with well, the cover letter, we'll leave that for Natalie. But Abby, before you went full-time, how did you manage it? Um, so for me, writing was a form of therapy. Um, I needed to write to actually let 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 off the, the sort of the steam that came with being a mother working in a very demanding job in the city of London. And also, I think having the determination to actually finish a book, um, I tend to try very hard 
to get to the end of whatever I'm writing. And so there's no time to do anything. You have to carve out that time. You have to be quite determined to take whatever it is that you need to take out of your current schedule to give it the right, to give the right in the time you need. So I mentioned that when I was working, I would, in fact, it was a known fact in the office that I would spend my lunch time writing. And so I wasn't hardly ever invited to any lunchtime events because I needed that hour to write. And then weekends for me, once my, before the kids got up for swimming on Saturdays, I would be up around about 5 a.m. in the morning and just sort of steal downstairs and just do my word count. And because all I was thinking of was to get to the end. And I always type out the end at the end of each manuscript because I have, I get a sense of satisfaction from doing that. And so that's a goal for me. So I advise you to try very hard. It can be quite tough. It might mean you denying yourself of some social, some form of social life. I wouldn't advise you to do that all, all the time. But if you feel, particularly if you have a burning story, if you're writing a story, when I was writing The Girl with the Louding Voice, I could not, um, I could not wait to get back into the character. I couldn't wait to sit down and just spend time with that character. And so because of that, I was looking forward to sitting down and writing. And so if you're in that space where you're looking, you, you, you can't wait to sit down and write that story because it's burning on your mind because you're so passionate about it, because you have a vision that only you can get out onto that page, I would say that writing snatches of time, it might be 10 minutes. Sometimes I write in the kitchen, I'm on the phone and I type into Microsoft Word or I type a text message to a loved one who, who will always ignore me anyway. But I'm writing a plot point. I'm writing um, a piece, especially with Aduni, when I was writing a girl with a louding voice, because she's um, she has such a unique voice. When I think of something that I feel that only her would say, or if one of my, my daughters who was learning English at that time, were well, learning English, she was learning to speak, um, at that time would say something I would type it to myself because I wanted to use that and so learn to use the, the, the tools available to you learn to use sort of audio as well so you, you're going into work in the in the morning you could have your headphones on and you're speaking to a, a software and it's doing the writing for you so that when you have the time all you're doing is editing so use what's available for you with the time that you have but make sure you keep your eyes on the goal which is to get to the end of the of the book and it might take longer than you than you wanted to, but what matters is you finish. It's only when you finish a book that it can ever get published, at least if you're writing fiction, or unless you're in that position where you have an agent already who who really believes in the first sort of few chapters. But that's not very often that you have that. That's really good with the you know the software that allows you to dictate stuff. I might have to look into that myself. Um, the second part of the question was with regards to a good cover letter. And I think that's to do with possibly, um, you know, getting an agent and um, that cover letter that you might need to send to them. So Natalie, when you do receive submissions um, and you get um, a cover letter as, as, as part of a, the submission guidelines, um, what is it that you're looking for um, in that cover letter that you know, should stick out to you and gives a good indicator? Yeah, I mean, it comes back to the elevator pitch. Um, so uh, some being able to very succinctly sum up, summarise uh, their story um, and convey that with real conviction and um, clarity. Uh, it comes back to the voice as well. Um, the, you know, that sense of urgency and character, character as an author as well, because one of the things we haven't really touched on um, very much is, is, you know, you as an author, you are your biggest, and a writer, you are your biggest champion too, as in, you know, you are a salesperson for your own story. So that is, that is part of the process too. So um, being able to convey that personality, um, uh, along with the story I think is is really important um I just wanted to pick up the the, the um, conversation around social media and the use of it so I do say and I have said uh that you know you don't necessarily have to have lots and lots of followers or be particularly you know uh active in order to get a publishing deal what I would say though is once you do have a publishing deal and a publisher the, the use of social media, particularly if you're from an underrepresented background, 
Um, and also we haven't really talked about regional diversity and I can see a few people have talked about that. Um, that it's really, it's, it's incredibly helpful. So be able to tell people about your book yourself directly talking to your audience, to your market, to your readers. It's such a democratizing thing to be able to do. And, you know, like, oh, if you're old enough to remember a world as I am, where it didn't really exist, that visibility, being able to cut through the so-called hate word gatekeepers, but the so-called gatekeepers, whether that's, you know, the publishing companies or the retailers, you know, their decisions about taking your book and then stocking your book and so on, being able to drive demand for your own story by talking directly to your audience is incredibly powerful. And then in addition to that, we have Amazon now, and if you're old enough to remember a world pre-Amazon, um, that uh, you really were in the hands of a certain number of people who were deciding whether your book was in stock or not in a particular bookshop at any given point. And now, you know, all books are available on Amazon. So you can drive demand and drive sales yourself. And we've seen that happen on a number of occasions with surprise hits. We have TikTok now. We haven't really talked about that. Um, creating um, phenomenons like Colleen Hoover at the moment. And so, so it's a very exciting space and a really important space. So I just wanted to, to put that out there, um, particularly, as I say, if you are from an underrepresented background, being able to talk directly to your audience. Um, yeah, it doesn't yeah. seem to be um, something that I guess you 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 need but I you know I can I have a sense that it definitely aids in it's a very useful tool it's a very yeah. yes and then you know when you are doing events telling people that you're doing an event you're in a bookshop <laughs> come down you know um, yeah. It, it's yeah it is really important one of the reasons that the industry um has moved at the, the glacial pace that it has done um, in terms of representation across the board is because, quite frankly, there haven't been enough people working within it who come from backgrounds like ours. So I got involved with a scheme called um, Creative Access. It's its 10 year anniversary this year, um, right at the beginning. And it's an internship scheme um, that is designed to bring people from underrepresented backgrounds, black backgrounds, and so on into the media and you know we are still in the publishing industry grappling with the number of commissioning editors that's why there are enough books um, from people from underrepresented backgrounds because right through the pipeline through the chain there haven't been enough agents there haven't been enough commissioning editors and so on and so on um, and that is a it is still a real issue um, across the board we've still got a lot of work to do um, I see another question, which is what counts as an underrepresented group, woman, Northern England. I over that. No, <laughs> that is. Shall I take that? Because I'm Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead. I can take that. Yes. Uh, so I'm Welsh. I should have said that right at the very beginning. So when I uh, set myself up as a literary agent, unbeknownst to me, I moved home, moved to this house um, that I bought a long time ago. And it's in Newport, my hometown. And the reasons I bought this house was because I didn't think I'd ever be able to buy a house in London, because the way that the industry is, is sorry, it's, it's an expensive city. London is an expensive, one of the most expensive cities in the world. The publishing industry up until now, still very much focused in one of the most expensive cities in the world. And the publishing, publishing salaries aren't massive. And so, so anyway, the long and short of it is I bought a house here, set myself up, um, and then, unbeknownst to me, discovered we went into lockdown, discovered that, the, that um, there aren't any or very many other literary agents in the whole of Wales. So what I would say is that uh, underrepresented, and by that I think we mean anyone um, who uh, has been othered in our publishing space. Well, and so at the moment we are massively over-indexing towards a certain demographic and regional diversity, yes. It's not necessarily um, race 
or LGBTQ, it's, it's a lot of different factors. Uh, we have been massively over-indexing. I wrote a piece at the top of the year about the, um, um, uh, how our industry looks at the moment. And we are now starting to get data um, with regards to the composition of the workforce in certain bits. And some of the biggest publishers in the world still showing 2% of its workforce are black. So, so we have quite a lot of work to do. Um, thank you so much, Natalie. Um, next question is, I guess, for, for really everyone on the panel. Um, how can I build my confidence and be less nervous talking with agents and meeting industry professionals? Maybe I should start as a writer. I think that you really need to fall in love with your story and your characters. It's that's what comes out of you when you start talking. You might be a bit jittery at first, but if you've written a book that you would happily read by yourself and it sort of amuses you, it makes you happy, makes you laugh, you can't wait to, to sort of get back to it, you're constantly thinking about it. When you start to talk to agents, hopefully you wouldn't just share, show, show it to yourself before you get out to agents. Of course, you know, get critique, get, get good feedback from your writing community if you have one. But when you start talking to agents, because you are so passionate about what you've written, about your subject matter, about your characters, hopefully that would um, come through. But if you have, I mean, I've been to pitching um, competitions before where I've, I've been quite nervous trying to talk about the book. I would say it helps to take just little notes down to remind you of some of the key points of the book. But hopefully when you start speaking, it, it comes through if you've seen them face to face. And if you're writing it, of course, perfect your elevation pitch, um, which has been talked about often here. And you can also get help from the from various sort of literary um, consultancies as well. If 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 you can afford to do that, that that sometimes can help you to sort of shape that um, pitch ahead of that meeting. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, does anyone else want to add anything or should we go to the next question? I just wanted to add quickly, I think, um, look, publishing is a really opaque industry. Um, I'd say to some extent, intentionally opaque. Um, I think uh, imposter syndrome is a real, real thing, real common thing throughout the industry, especially for those of us from underrepresented backgrounds. I myself came through a diversity scheme into publishing. Um, so I think I think the, the thing to remember is the editor might be might have been feeling the same a few years ago. Um, I think it's something that a lot of authors share. Um, but Abby gave really good advice there. Um, but also, you know, you're there because you're passionate about your book, and that will always come through, no matter how nervous you are, or if you feel like you're you're stuttering or whatever. You know, your passion for your book will always come through, and that's the important thing. No one expects you to be sort of a fully fledged Stephen Fry kind of writer, um, speaker as well as a writer. Um, your words can do the talking for you sometimes. So yes, just to remember, everyone feels like that. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, so next question we have, um, can you publish independently? Um, should we go to Arzu? You mean bypass agent and- Possibly, yes. Yes. Yeah, just as Absolutely you can. I mean, I don't have terribly much to say on this because it isn't an area that I've, had much to do with I do get asked every now and again I, I don't see anything wrong with it I mean this is might be an area where social media is more important um because if you think you don't have the might of a, a publisher behind you um but I also know lots of authors who've done incredibly well going straight to Amazon and but then again they do have a big social media profile um mm. and they have they really know how to how to work it um so I think it's always better to have an agent and, and a traditional publisher. I mean, in my experience, authors want to hold a physical book in their hands. They want to be able to go into a bookshop and see their book on the shelf. They want a, a good relationship with an editor and they want to know that they're, they've got a, a, a home for their developing writing career. So I would, I would always sort of recommend that route. 
yeah um I, yeah so i'll probably just jump in there just because I, I published romance so it, it's sort of more common i think to have independent writers than if you're doing sort of more literary or book club like ours is done um or non-fiction even um i've picked up writers off of ao3 if anyone is a fan fiction writer i've picked up writers off of kindle unlimited who are self-published um but it's a hard slog to get noticed on there it's you know you there's thousands and thousands of writers on there. And, and like Ozzy said, you have to be your own publicist, marketer, editor, um, ebook maker. You know, there's a whole typesetting thing that goes into it. Um, so yes, totally possible. You know, there are some hugely successful independent publishers, writers, massive, massive names who are making massive, massive money. Um, so if you have the time and capacity to do that, it can be really amazing. Um, but, you know, and, and we do, well, I definitely do look, I know a lot of people who publish in my area do look to independently published writers to sort of pick up on trends especially as TikTok becomes more of a thing, blah, blah, blah. Um, but just to say, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work. And sometimes it's nice to have a team around you, an agent to do that, a publishing house to do that. So yes, there are pros and cons. But yes, not to say that you can't be picked up by a big publishing house if you're independently published first. Awesome. And I have one minute to spare. So what I really want to do is go around to all our panels and you know ask for one tip, one piece of advice that you would give um, all of these um, writers here today um, for their amazing discovery submissions that, fingers crossed, they will be making very soon. Um, should we start with Abby, of course? <laughs> um, I would say that go for it. Uh, you know, you might be tempted last minute just to think that no one else is going to read or love your work. I would say go for it, um, pour in your heart into it and um and hope for the best and if nothing comes out of it in the way you think just realize that you haven't wasted that time or that effort that every single piece you write is you putting into a bank of better writing for the future so i wish you all the best and hopefully see you in print thank you so much abby um arzu yeah i would i would say when you're writing I mean, it's difficult to do, but but don't think about getting published. Don't think about having an agent. Don't think about ending up with an editor and being published. I mean, I would just I would just focus on the writing. Um, lose yourself in it. Don't try and second guess yourself. There's no one judging you as you're writing. Um, as Abby said, you've got to fall in love with your characters. You've got to be desperate to get back to them, and you've somehow got to screen out that that judgy voice or the fact that you're going to show it to someone who knows about this stuff one day. Like if you can lose yourself and not think about anything else or anyone else, that is going to be the best thing for your writing. And it will show, I promise. Awesome. Uh, Natalie? Uh, yeah, don't give up. Do not give up. So rejection and the, the um, rejection is part of the process. So people not necessarily responding or agents not necessarily responding or even readers not necessarily responding when you get to that point is part of it all. So I was on a panel event with the amazing Kit Deval the other week um, who um, wrote about several books, but um, she was there to talk about My Name is Leon. And she brilliantly explained how you know, her first two books, we haven't really talked about this very much, the, the commercial realities of the publishing process, and it can be quite stark, but she talked about how her first two books didn't really perform and prompted her to write her third book, My Name is Leon, which has been a monster hit. So to keep going, that's my top tip. Thank you. And finally, Amy. Um, I think big tip is that, you know, writing is a joy. Um, I think, you know, it can be really difficult when you come to panels like this and you're thinking about the admin and agents and prizes and winning and money and, you know, all that sort of the, the difficulties that, that come with sort of turning your your passion into some sort of job. Um, but I think it's, it's the important thing is, is clinging to that because that will see you through loving the book, loving the words um, and loving the process will push you through, which I guess is a quite a big demand. Love everything you do. Um, but yeah, just clinging to writing is a joy, I'd say. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, I really want to say a massive thank you to um, all of the panelists and all of you guys for joining today um, and sharing your amazing questions. There will be a recording of this circulated after the event. 
um i've seen in the um chat list but there is um keep an eye out on you know the online survey where you might be able to win chance of winning 200 pounds worth of books um and for more information on discoveries, then please visit the Women's Prize website, um, which has been posted in the chat. Um, and there's also a wide range of resources from the Curtis Brown Creative website. Um, another reminder that the deadline for discoveries is 15th of January, 2023. Um, and I also want to thank um, the Girl Dreamer team for hosting this an amazing event for us. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much. And um, thank you for your time and hope to receive some amazing manuscripts and um, books and new voices in the future. Thank you all so much for attending. <laughs>